All right. So we've all been here. <laughs> I will push forward. Uh, so what is the CGM? We all know this now. Uh, we've, we've seen it for a few, uh, few weeks now. Um, as Jess brought up, oxygen six ex is extremely important for the galaxy evolution equation. And uh, Aspera focuses also on this que question in a similar way. So I first started this journey with Aspera uh, asking uh, one big question, why is it so hard to map warm, hot gas and emission? So it turns out there's probably a few answers to this. Uh, one, it's very, very faint. This is our major hurdle. Uh, it's in the far UV, another hurdle, uh, and it's likely filamentary, perhaps. So the strongest line is this 06 line, as just spoke uh, a lot about just previously, uh, at about 1032 to 1038 angstroms or so, the doublet. So immediately we need to go into space. And faintness, we're looking at extremely low surface brightness emission for a lot of these more extended features away from the disks of these galaxies. So some of the faint stuff might get as, as low as uh, uh, one times 10 to the minus 18 ergs per second per square centimeter per square arc second, even fainter. And the filamentary issue is a little bit more subtle here. So there have been some previous efforts in absorb in, or excuse me, in emission, uh, particularly by, by Ott et al in 2003 for some nearby galaxies like NGC 4631 shown in the lower left panel here and NGC 891 shown in the lower right panel here. So in each of these two fields for NGC 4631, they're able to detect at a very low level. Uh, however, in NGC 891, they were not. So it's quite possible that some previous studies, even absorption line work, which is very crucial for understanding this stuff, that even studies in emission may have missed some of these sight lines simply because of luck. If the CGM's 06 emission is more filamentary than we expect, they could have been looking at regions like beta where they didn't detect and regions like alpha shown up here where they did. It's possible. Again, even more need to map an emission. So adding fuel to the fire here, uh, UV optics and detectors are historically very inefficient at these wavelengths, uh, which makes this very difficult. And it's incredibly difficult to get into space until now. So there have been some huge leaps and bounds in, in the last uh, decade or two in technology and in accessibility to space. So in particular, uh, Manuel Quijada at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center has developed some great uh, lithium fluoride coatings, these enhanced aluminum lithium fluoride coatings uh, for ultra high reflectance optics in the ultraviolet. So before these coatings, the standard lithium fluoride coatings are uh, somewhere in the ballpark of 50% reflectivity at, at, at its best. And now they're upwards of 85% or so. So that's a huge leap and bound. Uh, on the detector side of things, uh, Sholay Nixad and Erica Hamden uh, have worked on these electron multiplying charge coupled device EMCCD detectors that have greatly increased the quantum efficiency of classic CCDs uh, in the far ultraviolet and the near ultraviolet. And then of course there's micro channel plate detectors which have been steadily chugging along getting better and better and getting uh, <clears throat> more and more miniaturized, which is key for small space platforms. And uh, of course, uh, Falcon 9 and NASA have this uh, small sat rideshare partnership uh, shown here, some of these smaller payloads where they kind of build these all up like an Uber and uh, launch them into space all at once. So all of these recent successes have made accessibility to space for small platforms much more easy than they have been historically. So with that said, we built this instrument, Aspera, or at least we built the idea for this instrument and proposed it. Uh, so here on the left-hand side is our actual CAD model of the instrument, um, uh, just to show the basic idea. So Aspera is built on four parallel Roland circle spectrographs. So we have four, four spectrographs that are observing four distinct but adjacent fields of view on the sky at a, any given time. Uh, so each of those four uh, come down to a nice uh, primary mirror about 50 millimeters across, feeding into a, a toroidal grating, uh, which uh, separates the light and then uh, sends it on down to the detectors. So we designed it in this way to share two MCP detectors uh, rather than four distinct ones for each uh, because of cost, of course. Um, yeah, that's all the detail I think I need to go into about the actual payload. So you might be asking, well, how sensitive can we actually get? We're going to actually try and map all this stuff 
out to you know greater than 30 kiloparsecs or greater than 30 arc minutes uh, from these galaxies. So we need to get pretty darn sensitive to actually get to do that. Uh, so uh, on the left-hand side here, I'm showing our sensitivity calculation uh, with intensity on the y-axis. So smaller numbers here means deeper and integration time on the x-axis. So in order to get to those two detections that I alluded to earlier in NGC 4631 from that Ott et al. study, it'll take us about less than a day. Uh, so that's great. Uh, and if we were to get to our baseline sensitivity requirement, which is uh, the 1.5 sigma upper limit to that NGC 891 non-detection, which is four and a half times 10 to the minus 19 ergs per second per square centimeter uh, per square arc second, we could get there in about four and a half real feasibility uh, to build a great sample. And this is per field. So this is not the culmination of all the fields. We will be able to reach this in four and a half days of exposure per field. And remember, we have four of those at the same time. That's how we actually build this great 2D map. Uh, fun fact. So in our teeny tiny band pass, <laughs> so uh, we, we, we kind of shave our band pass to be very, very precise here for our specific targets. Uh, but within that, we are 2,000 times more sensitive than HST costs. So to further motivate what we might actually measure and see, uh, we took these simulations from Lauren Corley's and David Shimanovich uh, from their 2016 study, uh, shown in the upper right here, and uh, ran this through our, our system response, spacecraft pointing and jitter estimates, uh, and aberration to come up with a mock observation and to figure out how much time it would take to build that observation. And on the lower right-hand side here um, is the actual result of that mock observation. So in building about two days per pointing, in a total of 14 days, we'll be able to build this map on the lower right-hand side for a nearby galaxy redshift zero. Uh, each asterisk has, a, or each uh, uh, pixel that has an asterisk within it has a signal to noise greater than five. So we'll be able to measure all these kinematics since of course we are a spectrograph uh, measure the kinematics of the O6 extents and morphologies that track the morphological structure sizes that we see in the simulations. So we're very excited for this. Um, this is my last slide because I thought I was going to run long and I probably did. Uh, but a, a couple of words just about targets. So we have 10 nearby edge on galaxy targets, edge on so that we can very easily distinguish between extra planar and uh, disk O6. Uh, 10 of those targets, one of them is M82, uh, NGC 4631 are the big ones since they were already detected in emission. One was uh, yet. Um, yeah, and our launch date, uh, which I'm sure is a question on some people's minds, is slated for November 27th <laughs> of 2024. So uh, this is a very, very accelerated timeline. Uh, we're right now in our phase A equivalent. Uh, it's called something different in Pioneers, but that's not the point. Uh, and hopefully we will push forward next year very quickly uh, in our implementation phase. Great, so thank you very much, happy for questions. Carlos, there's one in the chat, I don't know if you can see it. Um, it's from Todd Tripp and he says, what wavelength range will be covered by the spectrograph and what is the spectral resolution? Ah, uh, yeah, so spectral resolution of about 2200 uh, within our, uh, oh gosh, what, are, what is the actual number? It's about 1028 angstroms to 1042 angstroms or so. Uh, Han Chung, I think, is on the call. Uh, who designed the instrument uh, can definitely give more detail than that. I'll uh, put it in the chat, yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, it's, it's between one, 103 nanometer to 104 nanometer, where right? just optimized to uh, observe this local O6 emission. Right, and, and we do have sensitivity outside of that bound, but our resolution drops off like an anvil after that, so. <laughs>